Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay at the back? Perfect. Okay. Just wait for the presentation. Um, okay. So, about five years ago, um, I have two children, and I one Sunday afternoon, I took them to the cinema, and we went to see this movie, the Lego movie, when it first came out. Now, I guess I shouldn't have been surprised. It was a really entertaining movie. You know, and let's face it, it was, you know, an hour and a half about selling the Lego product in one way or another. But what put the light bulb on above my head about storytelling was not the movie itself, but what happened after the movie. So we went back home, and the first thing that my kids did was run up the stairs, dust off their Lego. And two hours later, they came back to me and they went, oh, Dad, look what we made. We've made the spaceship that Batman flew in the movie. And it was swiftly followed by a sentence that came tumbling out of the mouth of my eldest boy. And he said, but we need to go buy some more Lego because we can make the other spaceship that was in the movie. Now, after I got over the shock of what might happen to my wallet, <laughs> the light bulb went on. What I suddenly realized is that movie spent an hour and a half teaching my kids that they can build anything that they want out of Lego. They're only limited by their imagination. That's what the central character, Emmett, that you see there, that's what he went through during the movie. He went from, oh my God, I can't build anything out of Lego to being a, a master builder. Now, what it kind of made me start thinking about is, okay, what other companies are doing similar things? Because, you know, Lego never talks to the kids about the Lego brick. They always talk about what you can build. And I suddenly realized there's this common, common thing that all the successful companies that use storytelling are doing the same. And it's this idea that you can put a belief into the mind of somebody that they'll recall in the future when they're making a purchase decision. Because if we're honest with ourselves, that's what we're trying to do. And so if you look at some, a company like Apple, Apple do the same thing. Apple don't talk to me about the processor inside the computer. They don't talk to me about what it's made of. What they say is, go change the world with the work that you do. That's something that sticks in my head. And it's the same with Nike. I'm a big Nike fanboy because I'm into running. But Nike never talks to me about the shoe. They don't go, wow, look at the sole on this trainer compared to Adidas. What they do is they say, you can be a better athlete. You can score the best goal of your life. You can run your first kilometer, run your first marathon. And then what I kind of looked at is, in addition to this, the other thing that all these companies are doing is they're not using story just as a marketing tactic. They're using it as a, as a whole business strategy. So if you think about you know, Nike, if they're saying, OK, we want you to be a better athlete, that will impact product decisions. What do we need to do to the product to help them get to that place that they want to get to? And the same with all of the other companies that I, that I kind of looked at. So use story as a strategy, not just as a tactic, because that's when it becomes really powerful. Because it might be that it changes HR decisions. Who do we need to recruit? to help people kind of in this mission that they're trying to do. So this for me became like my definition of what does storytelling mean for business? Because it's something that's spoken about a lot, but you know, it's not easy sometimes to get your head around exactly how we can use it. That kind of led me to start thinking about, okay, so if that's the case, what's going on when somebody makes a decision about buying a product or buying something? So I started looking at, okay, what's going on inside our minds when we do this? And it turns out that we all make the decision in exactly the same way, whether we like it or not. We all make our decisions on an emotional level first, and then we rationalize it and justify it in our minds. So emotion plus trust equals decision. I'm going to go into this in a little bit, but this is how I remember it, is that you know, somebody has to emotionally connect to what your product can do for them before they'll rationalize the decision about is this a good idea or not. And the reason that's the case is because of how our brains work. So we make decisions using two parts of the brain, our conscious brain and our unconscious brain. So our modern brain, the cerebral cortex, this is where we have our feelings and our rational thought. It's the brain that you're using right now to go, hmm, who is this guy? Should I believe what I'm, what I'm hearing? What proof do I have? And that's something that we all do on an ongoing basis. Our emotions sit somewhere else in these yellow and green areas here. This is where our survival instincts are. This is our, do I fight, do I run away, things like that. Now, I only recently learned that 
Emotions and feelings are two different things. Emotions is a physical thing that happens to your body. There's only six of them. Fear is one of them. So what happens when you're scared? Your heart beats faster, you get sweaty palms, adrenaline in the blood system, a bit like me stood up here looking at all of you. But now ask yourself, what happens when you're excited? Same thing, right? Heart beats faster, adrenaline in the blood system, sweaty palms. The only difference between fear and excitement is how your modern brain is interpreting what's happening to your body at a physical level. Now, why is this important for us? Well, if you tell somebody a story about an opportunity or a place that they want to get to in the future, that actually, on an unconscious level, makes them think, hmm, yeah, I want this. I want to get there. But very quickly, the modern brain kicks in and goes, yeah, but can I trust this person? What proof do I have? Can they do what they say they can do? Can this product do what it say, says that it can do? So this, again, you know, back to the emotion plus trust, is something that's really important. What's that? So, emotion plus trust equals decision. So, if this emotion thing is really important, how do we start to do that in our storytelling? It's not easy. It's one of those things where many companies never get into that kind of realm. It's always in the, the rational. So, when you think about stories that you might want to tell about your company or your product, there is a huge difference between stories that your audience wants to hear versus stories that you want to tell. And that's where most of us start when we think about telling stories. What do I want to say? What do I want people to know? But actually, it's always starting with the audience. So I'm going to show you a video that illustrates how you can do that in a way that's really kind of powerful and emotional. Now, it's not in English, and the subtitles, and the subtitles are at the bottom. So if you're at the back, you might want to just lift up a bit. But anyway, we'll watch the video, and then we'll talk a bit about it. If the video is going to load. That was the best build-up ever. ये मैं ये यूसुफ लंगोड़िया यार सी मेरा लॉट में मारे घर के सामने बड़ा बाग था उस बाग का गेट बाप के जमाने शाम को हमने वहां पतंगे उड़ानी और जाके यूसुफ के से जजरिया चुरा के खानी जजरिया और मेरा साहब नमस्ते मेरी पोती मुंबई वाली नमस्ते Thank you. 
हाँ जी कौन हैप्पी बर्थडे that video apart from thinking oh my god I nearly just cried with a Google advert but I learned so much from this one kind of video um, because first of all it, you know what I said in the beginning but that's a story that the audience wanted to hear you know it's a story that we can all connect with it's a story about childhood friendship uh, separation reunion and that's even if your family wasn't kind of impacted by the the kind of partition that happened between India and Pakistan. And that's why that this video got shared, you know, millions of times within the first few days, because it was something that really resonated with people. But the more I looked at it, the more I thought, there's something else going on here. And there's something that, this is something that most companies don't do when they do storytelling, but they did. And it's that they did not make their product the hero of the story. And that's something that we see time and time again. Your customer should always be the hero of the story. You know, it's, you know, your customer should be Luke Skywalker, your Han Solo or Princess Leia. So the hero should always be your customer. Now, the more I thought about it, I thought, actually, there's other stuff going on here as well. It also uses something called the power of association. One of the best ways to get somebody to care about something that they don't know about or they don't care about is to make an association with something that they do care about. So I'll show you another quick video, uh, this time from the New York Times, which is a great example of, you know, people kept, were caring less and less about newspapers and in general, like all of a sudden, we can get information from anywhere around the world, but this is how they use the power of association. Again, I might need some help with the video, because oh, it's sorry. not automatically doing it for uh, some yeah. reason. Alternative facts are just the, truth is, the media needs to be held well. The truth is, what the one taught is harmless. The truth is, to put the safety of the American people. The truth is, the truth is, the truth is, the So again, very short, but it actually does a really great job of making you think, ah, okay, so here's somebody that I can maybe trust to tell me the truth about what's going on. So think about how you can form an association with something that your customers care about and connect it to what your product does. Okay, so what next? Now we need to think about how do we find our stories. Now, finding our stories, we need to become, and I love this term, become a story archaeologist. I wish I came up with it, but I didn't. I stole it from someone. Um, but I love the spirit of what it tells us. And you can do this even if your company is three people and three weeks old, or 300 people and, you know, 300 years old. And it's this idea of thinking about why are we doing what we're doing? What, what drives us? What's the passion behind the business or the idea or the product? Now, I use GE as an example because it's a story that I came across and I did quite a bit of research to understand it. Um, and it involves this lady you see on the screen there, her name's Beth Comstock. Now, 10 years ago, she was the head of marketing at GE. And she had the unenviable task of having to figure out, okay, how do I tell the story of GE? Which, let's face it, that's one of the most complex storytelling environments you can think to have to do. And she worked with a guy that you see on the screen, a guy called Benjamin Palmer. And she said to Benjamin, okay, go spend a month inside the business. Go talk to as many people as you can and figure out what is this company? What, what, what makes us tick? What are people are passionate about? You know, go to R&D, go to production, go out into the field, visit our customers, talk to as many people as you can. Now, they learned a number of lessons through that process that we can kind of take takeaways from as well. So the first thing is what they noticed is that the powerful way that people spoke about things 
was not talking about what they did, but the change that they made. So yes, I may be helping to make a jet engine for an aeroplane, but what makes me passionate on a day-to-day -day basis, beyond the fact that I have to come to work and earn some money and pay the bills, is that uh, you know, I could actually find a way to make the materials 90% lighter, which helps take some more emissions out of the atmosphere. That's what drives me. So think about talking about the change that you make, not what it is that your product actually does. The second thing that they, they started to think about was, or what they saw, was that everybody at an almost geeky level had this passion for science. That's why they came and worked at GE. And they said, we need to embrace that. We need to embrace who we are as a company because not only did they realize that everybody who worked inside the company had this passion for science, but a lot of their customers did as well. So if you go take a look, they ran an amazing and kind of steeped in storytelling lessons as well. On Vine, they did this thing called the six second science experiments, uh, which was really powerful and worked really well. And there's lots of examples of their video based storytelling where they use this kind of principle around shared passion for science. And the final lesson that I picked up from it was they spoke about, can you distill all of this down into something that they call uh, wearable meaning? And what they mean by that is, would you put it on a, if you put it on a t-shirt, would somebody wear it? So like, you know, if you were put, I don't know, five gigahertz processors rock the world, probably you're not gonna wanna wear that t-shirt. But if you said, think different, go change the world with the work that you do, then maybe you would. And I think for me, that was just another way of talking about this, you know, kind of finding that emotional connection. What is it about what you do that people will care about? And that people, you know, what's the mission that you're helping them with? So, finding your stories. So next, it's thinking about, okay, how do we package that story? And that's where we need to start talking about story structures. And I could stand up here for an hour easily and talk about story structures, but I'm gonna mention two briefly. This one is maybe one that lots of people have already heard about called The Hero's Journey. Um, and I'm not gonna go through the whole, the whole process, but a guy called Joseph Campbell came up uh, with The Hero's Journey. And he wrote this book called The Hero with a Thousand Faces. And its history is he looked at 2,000 years of myths and legends and found that they all followed the same story structure because it was easy for people to remember. Now, what a lot of people don't know is he became really good friends with George Lucas, and he was really influential in the story structure of Star Wars. And of course, then Star Wars went on to inspire many, many other movies, and by all accounts these days, 50% of all movies use the hero's journey structure, and also books. So on the screen there, I did this is something I've used a few times, which is a more business-friendly version of the hero's journey, but it's really good if you want to do a customer case study, for example. And the only thing I'm gonna pull out today, because I haven't got a lot of time, is a section that says complications and high stakes. If you think about every movie, you know, let's stick with Star Wars. You know, when Obi-Wan Kenobi came and said to Luke, oh my God, you've gotta go save Prince Leia, he didn't just go and do it with no problems, no setbacks, no problems. And that's a little bit like life. Nothing is smooth sailing. Now, it seems really counterintuitive to think, what, I have to put some struggle in my story? But actually that's what makes it believable. And there's some really good examples out there of companies that have taken the, the courageous step of saying, we'll show the setbacks and how we helped overcome them. So think about how you can add struggle into your stories, but obviously not in a way that damages you know, anything, but, uh, but it's a really, really important part. The second structure I wanted to talk about is this five-step structure. And this is really good if you're gonna pitch. So if you're gonna pitch your product to an investor, you're gonna pitch to a potential customer, whoever. Um, this is a, a structure that was developed by uh, a guy in the US, um, and he used uh, Drift. I think most people probably know about Drift by now. Drift is like this uh, chat box widget that you can have on your, on your website. Now, what he did is he reverse engineered this structure. So, it's kind of five stages that take, takes us through how to make an emotional connection with somebody and build trust. So he starts with name a change in the market. And that's, okay, so we all have our mobile phones with us all the time. We even take it to bed with us and use it as an alarm clock. And we expect instant communication. You know, now if I want to talk to my friend, I don't ring them, I WhatsApp them. And at work, 90% of my communication is through Slack. But then he introduces the enemy. But then I get to a website and I have to fill out four. It's a bit sucky. You know, there's a good chance, maybe if I'm lucky, somebody will come back to me in four days, if I'm lucky. Why can't I just, you know, talk to somebody right now? And that's why they introduced TZ Opportunity. Wouldn't it be great 
if you could go to that website and just get into a conversation with somebody and get the answer that you need right now. So all through these first three parts of this structure, I call it the nodding dog syndrome. Somebody's going, yep, that's me. Yes, that sucks. And yeah, that would be great. That's, remember back to when we said about the brain, that's our unconscious brain going, yep, yeah, I want that. But our modern brain is going, hang on a minute. Do I believe what this person's telling me? And that's where the next two bits come in. So show product strengths. This is why this product can do it. And the last bit is present your best evidence. So here's somebody just like you that's been through this process, used this product, and had a good outcome. So that's why I love this kind of structure, because it follows emotion plus trust. So again, you can use that in presentations, in content, lots of different areas. And again, that's just two. If you Google story structures, you can, there are millions of you know, great articles and information about it. So last thing, and then I'll shut up. Story delivery. How do we package, how do, how do we kind of take our stories out into the market? So I'm gonna talk about just two things here, and I'm gonna use social media as the vehicle because most of us tell most of our stories on social media these days. Um, the first, and this is another thing that's quite courageous and brave if you do it, and that's how can you empower your community to tell your story through their eyes? Which is not, it's not simple. Now, one company that I've seen that does this amazingly is Wilder Goods. Wilder Goods is a company in the US co-founded by two women who set up a company to supply uh, outdoor clothing and equipment uh, to women who want to buy from sustainable sources. And they had no budget, three people, and they built a fantastic social community that's highly engaged and really helped to grow their business. And they did it through allowing people in their community to tell their stories. And more often than not, sometimes those stories were directly related to the fact that, you know, it's about sustainable outdoor goods. Sometimes it was stories like this, where it was people that have been through horrific things and the outdoors was what gave them solace. So again, it builds this community. And the, the level of engagement was you know, phenomenally high. Now, if you compare that to another clothing company, here's one from Blacks in the UK. Massive company, much more people, time, money, resources. They barely have a tenth of the kind of engagement. And if you look at it, they're missing one kind of ingredient because they respect the platform, which we'll talk about in a minute. So it's a great photograph of somebody you know, at the top of a mountain they've got to the tarn. And it's actually the photograph of one of their followers, you can see in the text. But what they do is they waste the opportunity to tell a good story. And they go straight for the, hey, do you want a 10 pound voucher? And of course, very little activity, very little engagement. Now, if they'd have allowed that person whose photograph it was to say, you know what, I woke up at 4 a.m., it was dark and cold, and maybe they've had some reason why they're doing it, and I hiked up that mountain, my knees were killing me, but all the time I was thinking about something, and when I got to the top, it was all worth it. Now, that's going to resonate with somebody because it's that thing about, you know, if you look at uh, North Face, for example, what's their story as a strategy? That's about don't stop exploring. So, same thing. So the, the main thing is how can you tell a story in a way that connects to that? What's that person trying to do? What's the, the future possibility that they're trying to get to? So second thing, respect the platform. I see time and time again, people go out, they develop a really amazing story, they work really hard, and then they tell exactly the same story everywhere. But actually, as we all know, we're all in different frames of mind when we're on different platforms. So. One of the few examples that I found was uh, one that Nike did uh, about a year ago. They, they launched an equality campaign. Now, if you went to the YouTube channel, you could see the full video. And you know, why do I go to YouTube? I go to YouTube to be entertained or to learn something. So my brain is, I'm much happier to spend four, five, 10 minutes looking at something. If I go to the website, I'm super interested. So that's when they're showing me behind the scenes stuff. I always call it like, you know, how do you show people what's going on behind the curtain? But then when you went over to Twitter, they were getting into conversations with people. They were getting into debates about what does equality mean on and off the court. And Instagram, which now is quite an interesting platform because you have two ways of telling stories on Instagram. You know, Instagram stories is actually about documentation. What am I doing today? What's going on behind the scenes? Whereas the, pho the photography is what it's always been. It's about 
high quality inspirational photography. So you can even tell the same story two different ways on the same platform. Like, you know, on the Instagram stories, you may show the behind the scenes stuff, what happened and how they made it. Whereas the, what they did is again, they respected the platform and they had much shorter treatments of the video uh, and really high quality photography. And just to, to kind of finish off, I dug up some of this, this is pretty old, but I love it because I'm a runner, so it speaks to me. But this photograph on the left, it respects the platform. It's a beautiful photograph. And as a runner, it speaks to me. I'm like, oh, I would love to be able to be there early morning, sun coming up over the hill, effortlessly jumping over the fence like that woman is. And the tagline down the bottom, it's a fence, not a finish line, just do it. Fantastic. That's like micro storytelling connected to you can be a better athlete. So again, it's really easy, as long as you do the, bit, the work in the beginning to understand what is it that drives people? What's that place in the future that I'm taking people? So that's me. I think my, for me, the, the three main takeaways is your customer is the hero, not your product, sorry. Respect the platform when telling your stories and emotion plus trust equals decision in your favor. Um, you can hit me up for a copy of the presentation and uh, I hope it was useful. Thank you very much. <laughs>